motion of cell biological tissue. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's been uh, very interesting so far. I think I will learn a lot. I will shift scales quite a bit here, and uh, I will actually move to talk about collective migrations in, uh, of uh, collections of living cells, that is, the properties of living tissues. As is shown here in these two still images that um, show essentially cells marching um, coherently to fill in a wound in, a, in an epithelium. So uh, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge, in case I forget to do it at the end, uh, the people with whom uh, I did the work, I worked, or actually people who did the work. First of all, most of the work I will describe was done in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Lisa Manning. And uh, uh, it was done by a number of uh, current and previous students and postdoc, uh, Max B, Jim Boyang, Michael Tchaikovsky, and Matteo Paoluzzi. And some of the work was also done in collaboration with the groups of uh, Giorgio Scita and Roberto Cerbino at the University of Milano. So uh, cells are clearly uh, very complex objects, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, I want to think of a cell as a uh, soft, motile unit that can crawl, as shown here on a substrate, by a cycle of uh, contractions and expansions which is driven by internal molecular processes that are capable of transforming chemical energy into forces, into mechanical work. And uh, they move generally pretty slowly, so, you know, tens of microns per hour, much more smaller than, say, the speed at which bacteria swim or so on. Now, in living tissues, and in particular, I'd be interested in epithelial tissues, two-dimensional sheets of cells, generally on a substrate, in living tissues, uh, cells move collectively, and now this is a moving of a wound-dealing assay, as it's called, where the epithelial cells march coherently to fill in the wound in the tissue. And of course, another uh, great example is one that Tomas Vicek already showed this morning in a different system. This moving, oops, okay, what happened? This movie down, no, it doesn't work. This movie down here at the bottom is, uh, um, hmm, can't find my mouse. Okay. Ah, because it's over there, right? Okay, this movie down here at the bottom is uh, of a, the embryo of a fruit fly. And these are the early stages of development. And what you can see here is that clearly cells have to move coherently to get to the right place. And first they have to flow like a liquid, but eventually when they get to the right place, they actually have to be able to support elastic stresses like a solid wood. And in general, it's clear that when cells move in a dense tissue, such as these ones and the top and the bottom of these two images, uh, how they move is controlled by the properties of the system, whether the tissue itself is a liquid or a solid. Um, cells will move very differently in these two cases. And so one of the questions I want to address is whether, what are the materials properties of a tissue and how are they are determined by the properties of individual cells. Let me show you a couple of other examples before I go discussing. I'm a theorist, so I will describe you some models, but I want to show you a couple of other examples from experiments. So here is another epithelial tissue. These are actually cells from the lung from the group of Jeff Redberg at the Harvard Medical School. And what it shows is that as, as time goes on, since day three, day six, and day 10, this tissue actually jams. Cells on, over here are moving as they would in a fluid, but eventually after about a week, they jam into a solid-like behavior. And this is highlighted at the bottom where you can see the individual velocities that are tracked by particle image velocimetry from this tissue. So uh, cell layers can jam over time. And as you can see, this is an example of what's called the confluent tissue. That means that the cells, there are no gaps between the cells. The cells completely cover the plane. And so the density of the area packing fraction of the cells is not really changing in, in the system. Something else is driving the jamming. And in this other example, these are actually uh, breast cells, uh, again, a confluent layer of breast cell. To the left is essentially jammed. You don't see a lot of motion. But then when you add a particular protein called RAB5A, which is associated with endocytosis, uh, essentially what happens is that the tissue becomes a fluid and exhibits these large-scale coherent flow-like motions. 
These are actually experiments from the group of uh, Giorgio Shita at the University of Milano. So cells can, cell layers, tissues, can tune themselves between solid-like and liquid-like states. Now, we are familiar with this kind of behavior in active systems, meaning systems composed of ten entities that such like, just like cells are active and motile. And uh, we are, what, uh, in fact, we know that we can actually go from sort of an active gas of particles moving around in random direction to something like uh, a flocking active fluid as we increase density. These are experiments back by some time ago uh, in uh, uh, skin cells. And as you increase the density, you see that you go to essentially a packed system. And uh, the velocity vector show at the bottom becomes smaller and smaller. So the system is slowing down. There is jamming due to crowding. But in this confluent tissue, as I already said, packing fraction is 1. Cells cover the plane. So the collective migration and the changes between fluid-like and solid-like behavior must be tuned by other processes, some, type, some mechanical feedback, cell-cell interaction, and actually cell shape changes occur in the tissue, certainly not by density. And so we need a new type of model as, composed, as, well, as compared to the agent-based or particle-based type models that many of us have been using to describe flocking or collective motion. So what I want to do today is essentially tell you about some models, the merge uh, models that have been used quite a bit in developmental biology to describe this kind of system, but by assuming them to be in equilibrium with active matter models, that is adding motility essentially to these uh, models under developmental biology to try to quantify the materials properties of tissues. And I will show you essentially two things. First of all, I'll introduce a model that actually shows a liquid-solid transition tuned not by density, but by cell motility and by cellular shape. And then I will add some kind of alignment interaction and show how that can drive flocking and coherent motion of uh, these cell monolayers. And uh, the part in gray is actually, I just want to advertise it, we recently actually developed a continuum model of the kind of system I will show, the, the kind of model I will show you in a minute which is sort of like a toner to flocking type model, but instead of coupling to density, couples to an order parameter field that describes cellular shape. So um, there is a well-known model in developmental biology known as the vertex model, which is a model, mesoscopic scale model of a confluent tissue. Again, here's my tissue. If you look from the top, it, it looks like a foam. What you see in white are the cell boundaries. Of course, the cells have a finite thickness, but we're going to make a completely two-dimensional model where your cell monolayer essentially is a bunch of polygons covering the plane. It's a tessellation of the plane with polygons. The uh, degrees of freedom in the original vertex model are the vertices of the polygon, but in my model, they will actually be the area and perimeters of the polygons. So each polygon is a cell. And uh, people usually write down an energy for such a tissue which incorporates, of course, some physics. There is a term where cells tend to adjust their area to a target value. And this describes the fact that the layer itself is incompressible, but change, cells, therefore, can change the area in their two-dimensional model by adjusting the height. That's what this term is supposed to describe. There is a term here that describes proportional to the square of the perimeter that describes bulk contractility. There is essentially a network, a polymer network, which tends to contract due to the action of motor protein. And uh, that's what uh, uh, that is, tends to uh, affect the perimeter, perimeter of the cell. And this term is essentially an a, a line tension proportional to the perimeter. And the line tension itself has a sign. Physically, the line tension, that is how big the perimeter is, will be determined by in interplay between cell-cell adhesion that tends to make the perimeter bigger and contractility of the cell that tends to make the perimeter smaller. I've chosen a minus sign in front of this gamma because I want to be in a regime where actually adhesion wins. The perimeter tends to get bigger because that's the interesting regime for, for our purposes. I can uh, uh, use the square root of the area A0 for my units of length and complete the square in the perimeter 
and rewrite the form by energy as quadratic in both area and perimeter. And when I do that, the model contains two dimensionless parameters. One is essentially the ratio of the coupling constants, Kp and Ka, and I will really not vary that very much. But the key parameter is the ratio of the perimeter, the target perimeter to the square root of the target area. And the target perimeter, of course, will depend on the line tension. So this that I will call target cell shape is a measure of how anisotropic the cell is. For a circle, this would be a number of about, I think, two point, almost three. For a pentagon, if, it's, if a regular pentagon is 3.81, for an hexagon is 3.72. The more anisotropic or elongated the cell, the shape gets, the larger the, uh, this number is. So that's the model that's been used in biology to actually relate um, the com cell configurations to the forces that are present on the edges of the network in equilibrium. And what people generally do is that they minimize this energy with respect to the position of the vertices. And uh, the cellular rearrangements, the main uh, type of cellular rearrangements that occurs in these tissues are known as T1 transitions. These are kind of rearrangements that can turn your tissue into a fluid because they allow for neighbor exchanges. You go from a situation where the two white cells are neighbors to a situation where the two uh, green cells are neighbors. And to do that, you have to overcome an energy barrier. What my colleague Lisa Manny did a few years ago, she actually studied the statistics of these energy barriers, and she was able to show that the mean, by minimizing energy, that the mean energy barrier, if you plot it as a function of this target shape parameter, actually vanishes above a value about 3.81, which is close to the value for pentagons, suggesting that the, above this value, the system is a liquid because this transition can occur with no energy cost, and below this value is sort of a solid. So what we did then was to combine this model, with ID, combine this vertex model energy with active particle dynamics and construct a model that we call cell propel Voronoi model that describes now a confluent tissue where the tissue is, now we actually use really a Voronoi tessellation of the plane, and we uh, assign also to each cell a motility which is in the direction, which is of fixed magnitude and is subject to orientation and noise. So the dynamics of the Voronoi cells, of the centroid of the Voronoi cells, is controlled by cell propulsion with direction randomized by rotation and noise, and forces which are obtained from this tissue energy I showed you before. And uh, the really interesting and important thing is that these forces are multicellular. You cannot write them as pairwise additive, and they are not just among nearest neighbors. So this is a more complex type of interaction than particle type interaction that are usually used in, in the agent-based model. So if you simulate this, uh, uh, this model uh, and calculate, say, the mean square displacement of these cells or polygons, uh, as a function of time for increasing value of this shape parameter P0, what you find is that for large P0, the system is a fluid. Mean square displacement is linear a long time, and for small value of P0, it becomes solid-like, the mean square displacement doesn't grow. In fact, more precisely, you can define a diffusivity as an order parameter, and it will go to zero at a value of P0 that now depends, is close to 3.81, but now also depends on the uh, motility of the cell, the cell propulsion speed, as well as the time scale for the rotational noise that determines how persistent the dynamics is. And uh, in fact, you can construct a, say, a phase diagram. This axis is the cell motility V0. This axis is the target shape index. And you find the transition using this diffusion coefficient as your, let's call it, order parameter between the solid and the fluid. The solid uh, have a small P0, so they're effectively rather round and regular, and they don't stray away, they're caged, these are the path of the cells. And in the fluid, they're more elongated, although it's hard to see by eye, and uh, they move around the system like a fluid. This parameter P0 really is the interplay, is determined by the tension, which remember is determined in turn by the interplay between cell cell adhesion and cortical tension. So surprisingly, the fluid occurs in the regime of large adhesion. That's because cells like 
to create more addition by extending actually their boundaries. And uh, well, that's just to image the fluid and solid-like behavior, which is colored a few cells, just to, to make a sort of a, a nice movie here. OK. Um, the really interesting thing is that you can actually define a structural order parameter for the transition. That is, if you actually measure the mean shape of the cell, so that is, take the ratio of the perimeter of each cell to the square root of the area of each cell, what you find is that in the solid, so this is different from the target shape parameter, which is a parameter of the model. In the solid, this is locked to the value 3.81, because essentially I have a regime where area and perimeter are incompatible, and in the liquid, it just grows linearly, so you have a continuous phase transition from the point of view of the structure of the parameter between solid and liquid behavior. And the reason this is interesting is because it means that a prediction here that can actually be validated in experiments is that uh, you can actually determine whether a tissue is a fluid or a solid by measuring the mean cell shape. And in fact, if you take this Q and set it equal to 3.81, you produce a line in the phase diagram that pretty much coincides with the place where the diff effective diffusion constant goes to zero. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, a couple of groups have tested this prediction by measuring cell shape. These are, again, the experiments by Fredberg at Harvard. And although, well, this is biology, so there are big um, error bars. But as you can see, as time goes on and the tissue jams, the mean cell shape seems to approach this value of 3.81 in the system. And similar results have been obtained in breast cell by uh, the group of Giorgio Shita. So <clears throat> that's, uh, so what I've shown you here is that we have a model for uh, a tissue that includes motility and cellular shape rearrangements and cellular shape changes and predicts an active solid liquid transition tuned by motility and cell shape. It doesn't quite yet get to this idea of how do cells coordinate their motion, but clearly it's important to know the nature of the material, to know how cells or whether cells can, can actually move through it. Um, next, I'm going to tell you about sort of adding alignment to the model to produce actually a system that can also actually move in a correlated way, that is flock. And uh, in other words, I want to ask the question how now to cell actually correlate their motion, as seen here in this protrusion, which is a finger-like protrusion, again in a, in a wound healing assay. So, well, one simple way to do it is to simply add an alignment interaction to our model that is modify the angular dynamics here, not just now rotational noise, but in addition we have an alignment of strand J by which each cell tends to align its direction of motility or polarization with the direction essentially of the mean force, which is in turn is essentially the same as the velocity of the cell. And so now we have a new parameter in addition to our cell shape parameter. Sorry, I called it P naught before. S naught and P naught are the same thing. We have the alignment strength, and then we are going to keep the motility and the persistence of the dynamics. We are going to keep those fixed. Um, what you find is that you, if you now try to make a, and this is just a pictorial phase diagram, I'll show you a quantitative phase diagram in a minute. This is in the plane of the strength J of alignment interaction and that shape anisotropy parameter. So for low alignment interaction, we have the same two states we had before, a solid state, and this, the group of cells has only been colored to show you whether, to highlight whether the system is a liquid or a solid. So in the solid, they stay together, in the liquid, they kind of Grow, uh, fall apart, but the mean velocity in these two states remains zero. For higher alignment interaction, of course, the system flocks. It has a non -mean, zero mean velocity. In the solid, this blob of cell just moves along without much deformation. In the liquid, it gets deformed, but notice they don't quite fall apart as strongly as they do in the absence of alignment. And in fact, if you look at the system a little bit more closely, what is now plotted here are the cellular paths in the rest frame, that is in the frame that is moving along at the mean velocity. The uh, red uh, bar denotes the mean direction of motion. 
And as you see, this flocking liquid seems to have quite a bit of order. Uh, most of the displacement in this rest frame are transverse to the direction of, of mean motion. And in fact, if you actually measure the structural property of this what we call flocking liquid, it turns out there are actually is a smectic type state. There are rows of cells which are kind of squashed in the direction of mean motion and fluctuating a little bit in the transverse direction. And uh, the pair correlation function shows more strong correlation uh, along the direction of motion, that, which is the red, than in the direction perpendicular to motion, which is the blue. So <clears throat> more quantitatively, uh, how do we quantify? So we have both now a solid liquid transition, and we have also a flocking transition. How do we quantify those? Well, for the solid liquid transition, we use, again, the mean square displacement and this effective diffusivity that I introduced before. For the flocking state, we sort of use a conventional order parameter, which is essentially the mean direction of motion. And then you can also calculate the fluctuations in the mean direction of motion, sort of the susceptibility, which will have a peak at the location of the transition. So here is the flocking transition between non-flocking and flocking solid. These are the, oh, this is the order parameter that goes towards one for increasing number of cells, increasing system size. And here is the susceptibility that gets more and more picked as you increase the system size. And here the same thing for the liquid state with a very, uh, a very similar behavior. So the uh, sharpening of the peak of the susceptibility with system size suggests that these may be a continuous phase transition, unlike in particle models with uh, uh, nearest neighbor interactions. And in fact, if you um, plot the location of the maximum of the susceptibility as a function of system size, you see uh, scaling. And uh, in other words, uh, this system is much more similar to uh, particle, to let's call them particle model, which are time models with so-called topological interactions, which is not surprising because the energy itself and the forces that drive the dynamics are indeed topological in nature in, uh, in this system. And I think for the people in the audience that work on uh, Bichak time models, and it would be interesting to kind of look a little bit more closely at analogies between and correspondences between this model and possibly the triangulation network that you can generate in the uh, particle models with topological interactions. So here is now the phase diagram, a little bit more quantitatively. Again, alignment interaction and shape index P0. So we have a static solid and a static liquid for low alignment. We have a flocking solid, that, which is a state that has a finite mean velocity and zero diffusivity. And the flocking liquid, which is a state with finite mean velocity and finite diffusivity. The red and green points are obtained numerically. The blue line is actually an, is an analytical estimate, which is essentially obtained by making a model of uh, a cell as a caged flocking particle calculating the mean square displacement and equating the effective temperature you can get to that to the en typical energy barrier that would be required to escape from the cage. And as you can see, it works actually quite well uh, with only, actually there's only one adjustable parameter here, which was actually the same as was determined for the transition for zero alignment. And uh, the uh, black points, if this works, okay. The black points are sort of a semi-analytical estimate again uh, that uh, is estimated for the transition between flocking and non-flocking liquid. Uh, essentially, for the liquid to become flocked, that is to move in a correlated way, it has to be that the rate of alignment is faster than the rate of structural rearrangements. You always have structural rearrangements in a liquid, but when the rate of alignment is faster than those, then you can get, you can get this flocking liquid. And uh, you can actually compare, perhaps not quite quantitatively, but there is actually a nice comparison with experiments that can be done by calculating um, a four-point density correlation function, which is familiar in glassy physics, called chi-4, which essentially is shown, so look at this curve in red, this is in the liquid, it will have a peak uh, 
the location of the peak of this four-point correlation function sort of describes, so what you have uh, in these dense liquids near the transition, you have the sort of packs of cells are moving together. And the location of the peak in this chi-4 essentially describes the lifetime of the pack of cells that moves coherently, and the height of the peak describes the size of this coherently moving pack of cells. And as you can see in our model, the green is without alignment, that would be the non-flocking system, and then you get this great announcement here, uh, when you have alignment, you have these correlated motions that are seen in the experiments. But actually, experimentalists have also calculated chi-4 from their data, and uh, you see uh, a similar behavior, especially in the liquid, with a peak, and notice that as time goes on in the liquid, the peak moves to shorter time, meaning the system is becoming more and more liquid. And notice also that there is a big difference, so just like in our simulation, between the size, or even though these, these data look the same, the scale here, here is 10, and this here is 150, so the peak in the, in the flock in liquid, where you have these correlated rearrangements, is much larger than that in the solid, where the rearrangements are very localized. So, let's see, if I have a few more minutes, yeah, I think I do. Um, so I've told you, I started out showing this wound dealing assay and saying that one of our goals was to understand how cells correlate their behavior to move together. And clearly this alignment interaction is one possible mechanism, but so far we really only looked at it in a, period, in a system with periodic boundary conditions, so there is really no boundary moving coherently. And uh, um, there is actually another... Uh, type of calculations and modeling you can do for this system to answer the question. So we're going to go back to wound healing, where the key question, which has been actually around for some time, is how do cells transmit information to correlate their motion and move coherently and fill in the wound? So let me see if I can get this to go again. So this is uh, uh, the front of cells, uh, or epithelial cell in a Hundilinga assay from the lab of Javier Trepa in Barcelona. And what is shown here in color are the forces that the cell exerts on the substrate as they're moving along. And uh, red is uh, forces to the left, right? Uh, blue is forces to the right. But the main message from this picture is that all cells are exerting forces of about equal magnitude on the substrate. And a long-standing question in this field has been whether, uh, so what, what drives the motion? And for a long time, people thought that the motion is driven by so-called so leader cells that essentially pull the one behind. But clearly, this is not so here because essentially all the cells are participating in this force generation that gets transmitted throughout the entire layer. And by the way, time scale for this kind of dynamics, again, is ours. Cell move uh, really slowly, these kind of epithelial cells. So, <clears throat> what we, so the key experimental finding that is associated with this idea that all the cells are participating in the dynamics is that, and again, we have here again an expanding cell layer, and again, what's, see, what's in color is again the force that the cells are exerting. Actually, you could think of this color as a measure of the local pressure in the system. And uh, the experimental finding is that in an expanding cell layer like this, information is actually transmitted via propagating mechanical waves. That is, if you sit right, say, at the middle of your expanding monolayer, and uh, measure, for instance, the variations in cell area, which correspond to variation in local strain of, of the system. So they describe local deformations. You actually get this periodic behavior. You get traveling like waves uh, or ripples in cell density, much like sound waves in air. Of course, these are very slow traveling waves. They travel millimeters per day. But they're traveling waves. You can see them by measuring cell area, by measuring local strain, or actually by measuring stresses, which can be inferred from a measurement of the forces of the cell exert on the substrate. And it turns out you can actually uh, capture this behavior even more simply than with the kind of mesoscopic model of Voronoi models that I just showed you with a very simple model by describing your cell layer as an active elastic continuum. 
And what do I mean? An elastic cell sheet with uh, elasticity uh, cost uh, for elastic deformation. But the activity comes from forces that are internally generated through the coupling through this uh, uh, motor protein that transform chemical energy into mechanical work. And uh, you, if you incorporate the dynamics of these and the, the dynamical turnover of this motor protein that gets bound and unbound from the network that constitutes the cell cytoskeleton, these, uh, you get a dynamical feedback between forces and protein activation that actually results in traveling waves. And in fact, here are the traveling waves in, again, the strain rate in red, the stress in solid blue, and the strain in dash blue obtained from this simple continuum model, which I thought I would mention because I thought it might be of interest to people here. And here are so-called chemographs. Uh, that is, these are plots in a color of the uh, local deformation for the monolayer, time is down, distance is in the middle, so you start with a monolayer which is only this big, and it expands, and uh, the blue and red denote positive and negative deformation, and this characteristic crossed structure indicates that these are indeed traveling ways, as seen in the experiments. These are experimental plots of the deformation. These are actually deformation rates, both of them, of the deformation measured in experiments. So, and uh, actually, one of the things we are doing now is, a, is, a, is a go back and look in more detail at this Wondilinga say using this mesoscopy Voronoi model to more precisely try to understand the interplay between uh, sort of pulling forces at the boundaries and these turnover chemical forces um, induced by, by the motor protein. So I think I should probably try to conclude. So what we've been trying to do are... Uh, Essentially, our big goal here is to construct a phase diagram for tissue. And actually, this is not a cartoon. This is quantitative. And the phase diagram for the model I showed you contains is the axis are the cell. What I showed you before is just the slice in the motility cell cell adhesion plane. The cell cell adhesion is controlled by this parameter P0, uh, the target cell shape. But we have also looked at the effect of the persistence of the dynamics that uh, can actually fluidify the system because it enhances sort of correlated rearrangements that tend to make the system, system more fluid, meaning uh, part cells can escape from their local cages if their dynamics is highly persistent, as it often is for cells. And uh, the idea is to construct effective theories of tissues where many molecular scales or genetic parameters may be fed into a single effective parameter, such as the persistence, the motility, or this target sh cell shape. And these parameters, perhaps, can be accessible uh, through experiments. Of course, many things, we are exploring many things that are still missing here, such as the role of cell division and death, uh, the role of heterogeneities, differences in cell properties, the role of the coupling to the environment, which is actually very important in tissue. Um, I also showed you that if you actually add to this model alignment of cell polarization with the local forces or, or, the, or the resulting velocity on the cell, uh, you actually get this large-scale streaming. You can get these flocking solid and liquid states. And uh, although I don't know that there, there is some suggestion that the unjamming driven by this particular protein, RAB5A, does indeed uh, uh, correspond to uh, the, the, the fluid state obtained there, has very uh, strong similarities with what we call here a flocking liquid state. That was the state where you saw these uh, large scale um, collective rearrangements. Now, one interesting thing here is that we find that the flocking transition, both in the solid and the liquid, is continuous which is consistent with what's seen in particle models and suggests uh, that indeed this fact, uh, the transition being continuous, might be generic for all these sort of topological, topological type models. And uh, we find this uh, sort of structural asthmatic order and dynamical anisotropy as well in the flocking liquid state, which would be interesting to look for in experiments. 
And um, I did not talk about this, but I wanted to mention again that we have actually developed also a continuum model of shape-driven flocking and rigidity transition, sort of combining these two at a continuum level. And what is interesting about this model is that it provides um, cells have to um, undergo, they move in order to create specific patterns, especially morphogenesis. And uh, this is generally understood uh, by coupling to co fairly complex uh, uh, reaction diffusion processes and the diffusion of various chemicals called indeed morphogens that have been very elusive, people have not really seen in the experiments. And so what our work is going in the direction of suggesting sort of a mechanism, purely mechanical mechanism of rigidity sensing associated with uh, um, the fluid-like or, or, uh, um, or uh, solid-like nature of the system that could be actually complementary to chemical sensing. And I can tell you more about that in another time. So let me just finish by showing again the pictures of the people who did the work and thanking various agencies that provide money. Thank you. Thank you for listening.